Hi there, my name is Brittany Dieter. I'm the vaccine educator here at the BC Centre for Disease Control. And in this section, we're going to talk about cold chain breaks in the field. There's quite a lot of content in this section, so I'm going to divide it into three subsections of about 15 minutes each. Let's get started. I'm just going to click the camera here. All right, so as I said, this is cold chain breaks in the field, and we're talking about preventing and interpreting, obviously, those cold chain breaks. Um, the content of this section comes largely from the Public Health Agency of Canada guidelines, and you can see the URL right there. There are many things <laughs> that are necessary to prevent uh, cold chain breaks, and we're going to talk about vaccine storage equipment, evaluation and purchasing. So that's the purchasing, maintenance and planning for equipment failure. In the next section, we're going to talk about vaccine storage practices. And in the fin final section, we're going to talk about using the vaccine stability chart and reporting cold chain breaks. So these are cold chain breaks by reason in the calendar year 2009. So you can see there are three major things here. Uh, that's power interruption. So power outage generally caused by a storm. Equipment problem. And handling errors. So that's, for example, if vaccine were to be delivered and there was no one at the health, uh, health unit there to receive that vaccine and put it in the fridge and it ends up staying out for you know, two days in the <laughs> room temperature. Um, you can see there are two different bars here. The lilac bar represents the incidence, so the percentage of the incidents that were um, of this type. And the uh, magenta, shall we say, bar represents the value. So if you have one break that includes, say, um, a more expensive vaccine like HPV or varicella or Prevnar, um, one fridge problem that ends up um, ruin, ruining, for lack of a better word, or ends up uh, having to get rid of some HPV vaccine can cost quite a lot of money, even if it is just one incident. The majority of cold chain breaks, as you can see, are between 8 and 15 degrees. Um, the majority of the vaccine involved in this type of a break would be determined to be usable. The vaccine would be determined to be usable by the bi biological product consultant using the vaccine stability chart. You can just see there, generally between 8 and 15 degrees. 35% of breaks and 62% of the value of breaks are due to equipment malfunction. So I'm just going to talk about um, a quick rundown of how and what equipment to select to minimize this possible source of breaks. And not even so much what to select, but what you might want to look for. An important issue to deal with is choosing a fridge size um, and a fridge type appropriate to the number of vaccines you generally have on site. When we're talking about what to purchase or how to evaluate different purchases, let's just talk about, uh, we're going to talk about fridges, data loggers, and minimum maximum thermometers as well as maintaining equipment. The second two we'll talk about in future sections. So why would you purchase a fridge like this, which is known as a purpose-built refrigerator? It has all of the same functions of a regular fridge, so it's able to maintain a required temperature through all seasons. It's large enough to hold the year's largest inventory, generally influenza season. Um, all fridges, we're going to make sure that they have a calibrated thermometer or data logger inside each storage compartment. Only vaccines should be in the fridge, and it, of course, needs to be in a secure location away from unauthorized and public access. Where a purpose-built refrigerator is uh, more effective than a normal standard kitchen fridge is that it is better at temperature regulation. So the mechanism in a purpose-built vaccine refrigerator has a very tight temperature tolerance and a quick reaction time to temperatures outside of the set range. A temperature probe for the vaccine control is usually found in the path of return airflow, therefore measuring the temperature of warmest air in the refrigerator. Let's talk about the defrost mechanism. It can remove ice from the evaporator, which is the back of the fridge, without raising the temperature inside the unit. So there's a small heating element wrapped around the evaporator coil that has the capacity to melt the frost off the evaporator quickly. This feature prevents the lengthy periods of time that are needed for defrosting in some other refrigerator designs. I'm sure we've all had that experience in a kitchen fridge where the um, freezer becomes locked in with ice. 
Spatial temperature differential just means that there's not a lot of difference between the temperature in different parts of the fridge. Some fridges, um, for example, where they have cold air coming in can be quite different uh, in terms of the temperature than an area over here where they have warm air exiting the fridge and going to be cooled again. So there's a lot of air circulation that happens to keep internal temperatures within a range, even if the ambient temperature, so the temperature outside in the room or outside, uh, if it's a sunny day or if it's minus 10 and snowing, it will do a great job of keeping a consistent temperature. Um, obviously, effects and changes of ambient, ambient temperature are important. The temperature in a room you know, might vary as much as 10 degrees, depending on whether or not the sun's pouring in through the window or not. Finally, temperature recovery. The temperature is digitally managed in a purpose-built refrigerator and any deviation from temperatures between two and eight where we like to store vaccines are sensed very rapidly and corrected. The drawbacks of this type of a fridge are that the glass doors let in light and so the vaccines must be protected with another layer, for example, the cardboard box that they come in. Also, the glass door lets the temperature rise very quickly if there is a power failure because there's simply no insulation there. Let's talk about the sort of kitchen fridge, quote unquote, um, also called a domestic frost free refrigerator. They are acceptable and they need to be modified a bit to make them the most useful uh, for the following reasons that the thermostat in this type of fridge is generally slow to react to increases in temperature and they can tolerate a wide temperature range. It's difficult sometimes to accurately set the temperature. For example, you know, it's just sort of like, you know, there's an ice cube picture on one side and a sun on the other, and you just kind of have to calibrate it. There's no um, little uh, temperature gauge that says here is five degrees. There's no air circulated when the compressor on the fridge is off. And finally, the defrost function in some refrigerators can cause big temperature fluctuations inside. So the little changes that we make are obviously uh, we have no vaccine that is kept in the fridge, but you would keep, say, for example, ice packs up there. You need to have cold water ballast. So this is just bottles filled with water. Obviously, as we said before, no lunches in there, <laughs> just vaccines and things like this cold water ballast. What the ballast does is if there is a power failure, it helps keep the temperature in the fridge from rising too high. And it also acts to keep any range of temperature fluctuations from being too dramatic because the water absorbs a lot of the heat or a lot of the cold. We have our thawed ice packs down here at the bottom, flexible insulating blankets, uh, varicella and MMR because they can stand um, colder temperatures if they're not reconstituted, could be kept in the upper level where there's cooler air coming in from the freezer unit. And all of our inactivated vaccines are gonna be kept in the middle, middle section where they're most protected. It's important in this type of a fridge to know where the air vent that's coming from the freezer is. Um, it differs by manufacturer, but the vaccines should always be kept away from that air vent um, to avoid potential freezing. Data loggers. Um, each health authority may have purchased a different data logger, so I'm going to try to talk about this in a very general way. What they do is provide real-time continuous history of vaccine temperature, including the time data for exposures. So it basically provides you with a map of all the temperatures that the vaccine has been exposed to and how long they've been exposed to each temperature. In some recent field testing that was done, the Libero, so that looks like this, was preferred in field testing, though it wasn't preferred universally. What people liked about it is that they have a USB port you can see here so that it can be downloaded in the field and interpreted by a biological product consultant at a health unit. The software that you use to analyze it is free and it automatically generates a report. It is accurate to plus or minus 0.2 of a degree. With Temptail, which is the product that is used in the reefer truck shipments that come from BC CDC pharmacy, the USB cannot be downloaded in the field, which is why it has to be shipped back to the pharmacy for determinations, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and so it comes with a little prepackaged envelope that you're going to use to send it back. It's accurate to 0.2 degrees. And um, a final one is called the Smart Button, and I believe First Nations and Inuit Health have purchased that. It's accurate to 0.5 of a degree, but it does require some additional hardware purchases for you to be able to interpret the vaccine information in the field. So usually it has like a little stand that you plug it into in the field to be able to read the data that's on it. 
Uh, minimum maximum thermometers are similar to data loggers, so they provide you with a history of the highest temperature and the lowest temperature that the vaccine has been exposed to. However, they don't generally have a um, mechanism for telling you how long they were at that temperature. They're easy to read, um, so you pop them in the fridge and you can just, you know, stick your head in quickly and say, okay, what's the, what, what temperature is this at right now? Um, so they're easy to read. Good display, there's no interpretation that's required. Temperate, temperature fluctuations outside the recommended range can be detected by referring to the minimum and maximum temperature readings. And it's usually you just keep clicking the button until you see them all come out. Or on this particular model, the VWR, you can see that they have the minimum temperature uh, here and the maximum temperature here. And this is the current temperature they have. Um, regardless of a product you're using in the fridge, nothing replaces the daily two time human eyes check of the fridge and recording that data. Um, an interesting little aside, sorry, a couple more things. One is the level of accuracy of the minimum maximum thermometer is very important and plus or minus one degree sensitivity is what we generally look for. And that means if the um, unit is showing you a temperature of eight degrees, the temperature could be seven degrees or it could be nine degrees. And that sensitivity is important because the vaccine, uh, pardon me, the biological product consultant is going to use that information um, to make a determination based on what the worst case scenario would be. So again, if it says that it's eight degrees and we know it could be seven or it could be nine, they're going to act as if it was nine. So the more sensitive you get, the better. Uh, this is just an interesting little aside. It's called the slush test. And, um, Founded, I think, on the World Health Organization website. Again, not saying this is something that you must do, but it's just sort of an interesting idea. The accuracy of a thermometer like this can be checked using the following test. Um, and they recommend, this is just uh, throwing it out there, that it should be done about once a year, which is what we would say, obviously, you're going to be checking the batteries to make sure that it's accurate. So they say, fill a polystyrene or a plastic cup two-thirds with cold water and place the cup in the freezer until a fine layer of ice forms on top and a small section of ice forms within the fluid, and that should be about two hours. If ice is present, it means the mixture is about zero degrees, or is zero degrees. You're gonna place then the temperature probe into the cup, not touching the sides, and observe the temperature after two minutes. The temperature should drop to zero degrees within two minutes, and um, what you're gonna do then is either replace the battery and test if it's wrong, or you're gonna send it off for calibration. And I know different areas have uh, different calibration schedules for their products. Maintaining equipment is as, as important, if not more important, than what you purchase in the first place. A maintenance logbook should be kept for each piece of equipment. Reminder systems should be in place to ensure that tasks are completed on either a daily, weekly, or quarterly basis. Um, biological product monitors, we say the fridge is your best friend. It's a very intense, intimate relationship that you have with the fridge. So I think Generally, uh, the biological product monitor would be the person who would be looking after this type of maintenance. And generally, there's a contract in place with a company also that would do, you know, do the bigger maintenance. It's more an issue of reminding yourself to double check that they are coming in on a quarterly basis. Um, when you're talking about maintaining a fridge, say you're having a company come in to do some servicing on a refrigerator, um, just in a routine sort of way to double check everything is working the way it is. You need to just make sure that staff, if you're not, don't happen to be on site that day, ensure that the staff is aware to protect the vaccine supply first. So that means taking all of the vaccine out of the fridge to be worked on and putting it in another monitored refrigerator rather than just pulling the cord and, um, you know, having them work on it with the vaccine just heating up and heating up and heating up inside. And it's one of those things that you think, oh, of course, of course, I would do that. Uh, it's just happened a couple of times. So really just a gentle reminder. And often I think it happens because the biological product monitor is maybe on vacation that day and the backup isn't aware. You know how these situations tend to unfold. So a couple of different maintenance, ta maintenance tasks. Some are daily, as I said, some are quarterly, some are weekly. Uh, for the daily maintenance, we know two times a day you're going to be checking the internal temperature with that min-max thermometer or another uh, product that you have in your fridge. You're going to check that the doors are closed. For quarterly maintenance, it would be things like cleaning the coils and the motor, cleaning the refrigerator and freezer compartments, and annual maintenance should be recommended in the manual of the product you got. It's important to note also, when I'm saying it's important to have a logbook of all the maintenance that's done on each of the fridges, keep that with the manual of the product you got.
Um, and obviously with the quarterly maintenance, cleaning the coils and the motor, that's the kind of thing that you would have a contract with an outside company to do. It would obviously depend, um, depending on the product you have, the fridge you have, and depending on the contract that's already in place in your health authority. So talk to your biological product consultants about that. For the equipment logbook, you just want to have information like the date of installation, equipment instructions, and a list of routine maintenance tasks, so anyone can do them if you're on vacation, dates of any routine tasks like cleaning, dates of repairs or servicing, and of course the name of the person, company, and contact information, both operational uh, information and after hours numbers of the company that provides the service. And just a quick note with the thermometer, obviously it should be placed in the center compartment away from the coils, wall, door, floor, and fan, and the probe should be placed in a vaccine box. The thermometers need to be checked annually to ensure that their temperature me uh, measurement is accurate, that the batteries are functioning, and you're going to change those as recommended by the manufacturer, keeping in mind some warranty requirements that might be attached to that. So for some different products, I think you need to send them in to have the battery changed. You need to check that the cables or the probes aren't damaged, and that if you have a chart recorder on your fridge, that there's an adequate supply of graph paper and ink pens. And with the calibration or checking that it's accurate, that's sort of where something like a slush test, if you had a little bit of time on your hands, um, that's where you might want to do that kind of thing. So thanks so much for uh, sitting with me through section one of Cold Chain Breaks in the Field. I hope to see you for Cold Chain Breaks in the Field section two.